before we start, I just thought maybe it would be best for you to introduce yourself. My podcast is largely about uh, wellness, uh, how to eat for health, um, and a whole bunch of topics. But we're really expanding the topic base because I think it's never been a more important time to think about systems change and how that has an impact on healthcare, which you go through in your book as well. So if I could ask you to introduce yourself to the audience, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm George Monbiot. I'm a writer, journalist, activist, professional troublemaker, um, write about all sorts of things, mostly with an environmental slant, but a lot of um, social and political and stuff too. your book, which is hopefully going to be the focus of our conversation, but I'm sure we're going to digress. Um, you wrote this a couple of years ago, uh, Out of the Wreckage. What was the impetus for the book and what kind of spurred you on to go in this kind of direction? Because a lot of your work, I think, is spanned around you know, environmentalism, but you've, you've done inve in, uh, investigative journalism at the start of your career too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'd, I'd written a book before, or it was a collection of essays called um, How Did We Get Into This Mess? And, and a lot of people... It really gets said, OK, you've shown us how we got into this mess. Now, how are we going to get out of it? So um, so so really, that was the impetus that, you know, and I had to sort of answer the question. But also, I, I've become very interested in sort of breaking out of the standard political box. You know, we, we see politics in very narrow terms in this country generally in party terms, you know, you're either Labour or Conservative or you might possibly be Lib Dem or Green or Brexit or something, but but you're defined by your party and it's very much controlled from the centre. Here's the party structure, hoping to get into government, hoping to run the nation from the centre. And my feeling is, well, it's just not where people are at at all. The great majority of people, you know, we don't want to be part of that incredibly simplified and top-down system when you look at how people organize themselves and boy have we been seeing that during the pandemic you know this incredible flowering of mutual aid as mm. people help each other get through this difficult time you'll see that you know we're not just sitting there passively waiting for someone to tell us from on high what we ought to be doing and how we should be living our lives. And we can create a lot of the solutions ourselves. And my feeling is that what we urgently need in this country and elsewhere is a hybrid system where we need the representative politics because you know you do need government to run an NHS and to uh, run pandemic responses and lots of other things like that that only governments really can do. But you also need um, much more participatory democracy, much more bottom up, grassroots, deliberative democracy, where we can sit down together and solve our common problems. And, and it's sort of exploring that hybrid system and exploring how you can bring community together, make much richer community and use that community as a seedbed for a new politics to grow, a politics built by the people, for the people, rather than this top-down, simplified thing controlled from the centre. I'll be honest, my personal uh, perspective as I've grown up, um, or particularly over the last 10 years, is that I've been quite passive about politics. And I think that's reflected by quite a few of my colleagues as well, i.e. it's too far removed from me. My vote doesn't have or carry that much weight. Um, and I'm sort of apathetic to any changes that I could be uh, a party of when it comes to the political sphere. I've done some stuff within my locus of control, so trying to reform medical education to include nutrition and lifestyle medicine, which is one of the most powerful tools that we have. Um, but when it comes to politics and fundamental changes that have an impact on a healthcare system, I felt quite removed from it, if I'm honest. What do you say to that sort of like um, apathetic response or you know people who become apolitical? I'd say, isn't it interesting how you put those in two different boxes? You know, you've done all that great work on nutrition and stuff, you know, which has been really positive work, which is political. You know, you're yeah. trying to create change among people. That's political. You know, all politics is, is relations between people. And you're trying to change those relations in a very positive way. And then you say, but I'm not into politics. But <laughs> yeah. because, and that's exactly the problem. That's exactly where we are, that we have this thing called politics, which is over there. It's not in our lives. It's it's in it's somebody else is doing that stuff and they're doing it to us. 
you know, and it's something which, well, you know, we might be, we might decide to participate in a sort of little way, but running around stuffing envelopes for the party or voting every five years. But it's basically this thing being dumped on us from from above. Whereas what the first thing you were talking about, that is also politics. In fact, that to me is the lifeblood of politics, is people taking action to improve stuff, even if it doesn't go through political parties. And, and the fundamental problem I think we've got here is that society is this incredibly complex system. I mean, fantastically complex. Even one person is an incredibly complex system. You know, we, our physiology, as you well know, is highly complex. Our brains are highly complex. We behave in all sorts of unpredictable ways because we have these emergent and adaptive characteristics which complex systems have. Put two people together and, and, and you square the complexity. <laughs> you put... 65 million people together and you've got this phenomenally complex system. I mean, it's staggeringly, incomprehensibly complex system. But they try to govern us as if it is a simple system, as if you can say, right, here is a diktat, which we as a legislature are going to pass down and we're going to make you do this or we're going to respond to what we think the public will is and translate it into legislation this way. And it's this really crude, brutal, simplified way of handling a phenomenally complex society. Now, I happen to think that complexity is a good thing and that the great diversity of people's engagement with each other, engagement with the systems that surround them, that's a really good thing, which we should be building on and working with and allowing to flourish and allowing its unpredictable, emergent, adaptive characteristics to come to the fore in lots of good serendipitous ways, which they do when you let them, as we've been finding during the pandemic with all these incredible social movements just emerging apparently out of nowhere, but actually emerging out of the community spirit that has long been there, but bubbling under the surface. And so the politics we need is a politics that says to you, what you are doing is political. What you are doing is crucial to shaping the nature of this country. And it should be embedded in a network where all those actions are recognised as being political and where we can all participate as equals in producing this better nation that we want. And that's where we can bring together the sort of actions that you and your colleagues have been taking, which we could broadly describe, I think, as community action in one way or another, with a community politics, which means a participatory politics, a deliberative politics, where we're sitting down, we're talking to each other, and then we're passing decisions up. We're sort of devolving them upwards, where we could almost say, right, the primary unit of political decision making is the local community, and we devolve decisions upwards towards bigger and bigger political units, but basically they're ultimately responsible to us, ultimately responsible to that local primary unit. And I think that would much better reflect the complexities and diversities and wonderful abundance of our social lives. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I think it's the, and you talk about this at the start of the book, it's the narrative that we allow ourselves to believe or the dominant narrative that something is outside of our control and we don't have any influence over it. Whereas if you put it in terms of, okay, what kind of things can you get involved at a local level or a systems level within your uh, specialty or within your field or within your industry, you know, it, it kind of politics that way, it kind of uh, makes you understand just how much impact uh, a single person or a group of people can have. Um, and I, I suppose, what, how can we change that narrative apart from obviously, you know, listening to things that you do and, and, and getting involved in social, uh, social initi initiatives? How do we actually change the narrative that actually empowers people and, and makes them realize just how much control that we, we can have? Well, I'm really glad you introduced the issue of narrative because recognizing the importance of narrative in politics is, is almost half the battle. It's like, because um, it, it's it, the person who, who tells the story or the movement, the group that tells the story uh, that captures other people's imagination 
is is the one that becomes a sort of uh, sweeping force in 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 politics. And if we don't tell a good story, somebody else else is going to tell a good story, and it might not be the story that is going to be useful to us. So if we look at the whole history of politics and indeed of religion going back thousands of years, the movements that have succeeded are the ones that have a new narrative to tell. But it's a particular kind of narrative. What's very interesting to me about this is, is that when, when you look at the narratives which have worked, even if they are completely different in terms of where they're trying to take us and what they want you to do, whether it's a sort of ultra-capitalist one or a communist one or a religious narrative or an atheist narrative, they, they all have basically the same narrative structure. Now, you've probably heard the debate between how many basic plots there are. You know, some people say there's three and some people say there's five and some seven and some nine. It's always an odd number for some reason. Uh, but, you know, there's meant to be a certain number of basic plots. And I think, you know, we can agree there are common narrative structures which are used again and again, where you get lots of different books and films and stories all using a basic structure, even if they are used for to tell completely different stories. And the one which seems to work always in religion and politics is the restoration story. It's a narrative structure which goes as follows. It says, the land has been thrown into disorder by powerful and nefarious forces working against the interests of humanity. But the hero or heroes confront those powerful and nefarious forces against the odds, overthrow them and restore harmony to the land. And, and in its different forms, that restoration story has been told again and again and again, whether it's been told, for instance, in, in the Christian religion or the Muslim religion or been told by the Keynesians or the neoliberals or the Marxists or the Nazis or the Democrats or uh, you know, any movement at all. Which has which has succeeded in politics or religion tells that story and and while it's a a necessary condition it might not be a sufficient one but it has to be there uh, mm. if you're going to succeed in politics it seems that you can't get there unless you tell a convincing restoration narrative and it's very interesting that people in the past seem to have been aware of this. So when laissez-faire economics completely fell apart with the Great Depression um, just under 100 years ago, um, causing appalling um, suffering and disruption, John Maynard Keynes sat down and he wrote his general theory, which is a very good restoration narrative. It, it, says, it basically says the land has been thrown into disorder caused by the powerful and nefarious forces of laissez-faire politics, the economic elite basically grabbing all the money for themselves, destroying effective demand, um, ensuring that there's no circulation within the economy. Um, but uh, the heroes of the story, the, the, the working and middle classes um, empowering a benign state will, against the odds, overthrow those economic elites and restore harmony to the land in, for, in the form of uh, money spent into the economy through public works, uh, generating uh, employment, which generates consumption, which generates growth. Um, and, and it was a very powerful and effective restoration story. Now, some people absolutely hated the Keynesian story. Uh, people who could best be described as the neoliberals who basically wanted to restore a kind of laissez-faire economics, but in this case, empowered by the state with sort of various new features. So people like Friedrich Hayek, Lud Ludwig von Mises, later on Milton Friedman. And, um, and they sat down quite consciously and deliberately to write a restoration story of their own, uh, which, which said that the... Um, the land has been thrown into disorder by the powerful and nefarious forces of the overmighty state, which by controlling our lives and taxing us and regulating us, crushes freedom, destroys human opportunity and potential. But the hero, the freedom-seeking entrepreneur, will confront uh, that disorder 
overthrow those powerful and nefarious forces against the odds and restore order to the land in the form of liberty and opportunity. That was their story. It was a very overt and deliberate restoration story. And when Keynesianism ran into trouble in the 1970s, they were able to step forward and say, here's, here's a new story. And politicians eventually across the political spectrum said, oh, thank God, there's a new story. We'll latch on to this. This is a story. And, and then that completely and spectacularly fell apart in 2008. The whole neoliberal edifice just collapsed uh, spectacularly. And so the opponents of neoliberalism came forward with nothing. We had no new story to tell. And so we had some people say, well, maybe we should go back to Keynesianism. And you just can't, you know, you can't go back in politics. You know, you don't inspire people by saying, we'll just, we'll just do what they did 50 years ago. That, that's, that doesn't excite people. Also, you know, there's a fundamental flaw for the 21st century is that it depends on sustaining levels of consumption. Mm. And, and, you know, those levels of consumption are destroying our life support systems. Mm. Um, but, and other people said, well, maybe we should have a bit less neoliberalism. So neoliberalism light. And, you know, it's just that doesn't inspire people either. And that just creates an opening for neoliberalism to continue, which, of course, is what happened. And so we get stuck with the old discredited system, even when it's fallen apart, because there's no new story. So so our job, really, I for part of our job, I feel, is to tell that new restoration story. Yeah. And I feel it, it is rooted in the sort of things that we're talking about. It's rooted in community. You know, it's you. You could tell it sort of roughly along these lines that you know the land has been thrown into disorder by the powerful and nefarious forces of neoliberalism, which by breaking society apart, atomizing and ruling, are saying you know you're all individuals. There's no such thing as community, and we're going to break apart the social fabric, privatize utilities, um, deregulate, destroy trade unions, destroy social action to even say in mrs thatcher's case there is no such thing as society um they they have um really sort of destroyed our capacity to solve our problems um but we the community the heroes of the story by coming together and and forming a grassroots solidarity um a sort of social insurgency of the of exactly the kind we're seeing during this pandemic and building that into participatory politics um can against the odds overthrow those powerful and nefarious forces and restore harmony to the land that's the basic idea <laughs> i mean it's it's really interesting there's so many different things that that really do resonate with me there and i want to touch on but prior to the pandemic i would have thought that the the dominant theory is that the natural order of things is inequality and and that's borne out by perhaps the advent of social media where we prize those or we aspire to be like those who have the fame who have the likes who have the the status in society um but now i think in a post-pandemic world perhaps people will realign what our true values are and the values that actually benefit our overall well-being not to mention our health as well i mean there's a lot of evidence that you know attachment and community and belonging and you know the opposite of alienation which is a which is the dominant um uh, illness of our society in the uk and, and the us as well um uh, we've been suffering with so so now i think it's even more of an opportunity to really change that that story that we tell ourselves in society and, and re-establish what our values should be yeah no i i think it is I, I mean it's you know it's a terrible crisis and and you will have seen the most appalling suffering you, you know we, we know that it's really really hammering people this and it has exposed many of the weaknesses of the system that we're in you know a, a government which didn't want to govern which was basically tearing itself apart the self-hating state saying the state shouldn't exist basically and we suddenly discover oh my god we need the state we desperately need the state we need good government we need competent government we need people who actually care about others in government um you know which that, that would be a nice thing wouldn't it to have empathetic <laughs> people in government um who who don't just sort of dismiss it all as as oh well you know we get herd immunity and if thousands of people die yeah if thousands of people die they're going to die anyway eventually so what's the problem <laughs> which has unfortunately you know with some people really literally been the attitude I mean yeah. the most extreme case being Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil who who literally said so what 
when he was confronted with mm. with the numbers of dead and and you know it's it's a peculiar interesting thing that there's as you probably know there's a huge amount of psychological work um or also in anthropology in in neuroscience in um e evolutionary science showing that the old story we tell ourselves the sort of hobbesian story that we're fundamentally selfish and greedy we're all at war with each other just doesn't stack up at all I mean, a lot of experimental work um, masses of, of science on this showing that yeah we've all got some selfishness and greed in us but they are not our dominant values our dominant values are much more about togetherness, about about cooperating, about creating a nice um, social setting for ourselves and those around us, uh, working together, um, um, kindness to others, family, community. These are our dominant values. And we've been told a lie on this. I mean, a total lie about who we are. But one of the reasons we think we're these selfish and greedy people is that a very high proportion of those who govern us are psychologically atypical. I mean, broadly speaking, we're a society of altruists governed by psychopaths. And and the question which keeps occurring to me is, why do we let this happen? Yeah. <laughs> why does this keep happening? You know, you look around the world and you'll just see a whole load of really damaged and strange and wholly atypical people governing nations full of great people with tremendous potential and intelligence and empathy and kindness towards others who could do so much better job than they're doing. Why do we elect these buffoons constantly to govern us? And, and that's you know a big question we, we should all be asking ourselves at the moment. It's, it's interesting you, you, you say that because I think that's essentially why people have an apathy towards the political system, quote unquote, um, because we are governed by people who don't have the same perhaps altruistic values that we share as a community. We're sold this idea that we are competitive and we should be individualistic, even though, and I see this from an evolutionary perspective, it would have been absolutely impossible for the human race to exist if we were of that mindset, because you know, we're not incredible predators. We're not, you know, we don't have the attributes of uh, a normal predator to survive in a in a wild uh, environment. Um, so we had to work together. And, and there's lots of neurobiological evidence to suggest that we work better um, when we have attachment, when we have um, connection, physical connection with our, with our families and communities. So this, I think, uh, s uh, this actually breeds a lot of apathy towards the political system because when you look at your ballot list and you look through the names uh, and you look at their backgrounds, you don't resonate with them at all. And this is something I think needs to change going forward, but I just don't know how. And, and I think a lot of people listening to this will, will, will resonate, will, will, will echo that. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think it's partly that the system almost inevitably produces candidates like that. You know, for a start, in, in a lot of places, you need a lot of money if you're going to succeed, if you're going to get anywhere. And the people who are good at raising money are often the last possible people you would want representing you. <laughs> because either they're extremely rich already or all their friends are extremely rich or they're prepared to suck up to billionaires and corporations to get that money. And you think, no, that's exactly the opposite. So who we need in charge <laughs> because we need them you know representing the people not the billionaires and and so that's part of it um it's also you know it is this remote system it, and a remote system a system that, that's remote from our lives that's not on a day-to-day -day basis controlled by us is a system which is very easy to take over to capture by mm -hmm. by an elite of any kind um and and it, it sort of is almost set up for ownership by elites and so we yeah end up alienated not just from the individual characters but you know from from the whole setup really mm. and when you look at how it could be done like for instance the participatory budgeting that was done in a, on a big scale for about 15 years in Porto Alegre in Brazil or like um, the Better Reykjavik program in Iceland, or a very similar thing, Decidi Madrid in, in Spain, where um, cities are basically run by the people. Um, and with this really interesting, innovative, participatory ways of doing it, nowadays 
using um, um, uh, new communications technologies, you know, which really lend themselves very well to grassroots democracy. Mm-hmm. You just ask yourself, why the hell does it still have to be like this? Why do we have this sort of cod medieval system in this country with all the sort of black rods and the sergeants at arms, you know, and all this stupidity, all these people wandering around in gaiters with sort of frilly ruffs and gold braid? It's like, yeah. this is ridiculous. <laughs> this is, you know, if, if you design something to be more alienating, you know, visually and in terms of its whole tenor and character, you could not do a better job than that. It says... They exist in this bubble, which is totally impenetrable to the normal mm. person. You know, we can't even understand what the hell's going on, let alone we can't physically get there. You know, you're barred. I mean, you know, one of the main parliamentary buildings is even called Portcullis House. You know, Portcullis <laughs> is what keeps you out, <laughs> and and it's and and it and it just everything about it is wrong. If you want buy-in, if you want people to actually feel this belongs to me this is a system that i'm part of and that is part of me and so you know and, and i said you know I, I i continue to think that we need representative democracy alongside participatory i don't want a pure system of either kind mm. so while i feel that we we still need representative democracy and participatory democracy it shouldn't be either or the representative side also needs massively to be reformed and changed. It needs to look like us, mm. you know, to look like the diversity of society and the the not just all the different peoples, but all the different ways of living and ways of being. It looks like nothing that the rest of us have anything to do with. I mean, it literally is a culture of its own. Mm. which which looks as far removed from our lives as could possibly be, unless you're one of those people who do go around in fancy dress all the time with <laughs> rough and tights and, and, and gold braid, you know, <laughs> carrying some massive fancy bit of gold hardware in your hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so ridiculous. It makes me so angry. You just see yeah. this and you think, yeah, you know, you're saying it's tradition. You know, they say, oh, it's tradition. And you say, no, no, actually, that tradition has a purpose, which mm. is to shut us out. Mm. And to keep it within the sphere of the elites, to make sure that 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 orbit is not something that we penetrate. Yeah. And I see these sort of like, you know, I'm glad you used the word tradition there, because I think, you know, I see that on a micro level and a macro level. We see that within the healthcare system, we've always done this, this, this way. And this is why we do it without really questioning why we do it that way. It's it's one of the reasons why we still use fax machines in the NHS, which is apps it drives me mad every time and i work in like a a very good trust a very well-funded trust as well that is averse to uh progress electronically that will have direct impact on on patient care and i think you know we see this every step of the way within the nhs um but one of the things i wanted to talk about and and it was important there because you, you mentioned how um the reason why we have these political figures um that carry the same characteristics generation after generation is because they suck up or they they come from wealth or or or, you know they have links with wealth but um uh, what we saw in america with bernie saunders the first time around anyway was this concept of big organizing and it's the first time i've actually heard of this and it really got me excited because i think what we could witness in a post-pandemic era is the realization that big organization can have an impact across different uh, uh, industries and beyond politics in the way we currently see politics right now. Yeah, no, absolutely right. So big organizing is this idea that instead of professionalizing a political campaign or indeed any sort of campaign or any sort of movement where you have this sort of core of professionals who are going to do do the job for you and you hire them and you pay them to do it, you delegate the vast majority of tasks to volunteers who then delegate to more volunteers and create these sort of traveling waves of 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 activism and action um and uh, and basically you have this incredibly devolved system based on what the pioneers of it called radical trust mm. you know the standard political model is you have this highly centralized political party which says, right, here are what, here's what we're going to do. We're going to micromanage everything down to the nearest detail. If you want to volunteer, you can stuff envelopes or you can knock on doors. That's it. Yeah. And people still volunteer because you know people really do believe in politics. They want 
democratic change, and that's a great thing, but it's very thin involvement. Yeah, it's 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 mm -hmm. quite insulting, really, to people's intelligence that this is all we're going to allow you to do. Whereas the Sanders campaign pioneered this thing, which was actually picked up by the Corbyn campaign also in 2017, and we saw two very near misses, mm -hmm. uh, starting from a position of real disadvant uh, d disadvantage. They very nearly scraped in both of them. It all got a bit wrong subsequently, but but we saw those two um, campaigns using this extraordinary new method of basically saying, right, <clears throat> we're going to set the general tone and direction from the centre, but um, when instead of raising huge amounts of money and hiring a huge staff, we're going to do it all in a shoestring budget. We're going to delegate really important tasks to volunteers not being paid at all to set up local networks, set up local meetings, um, set up the whole sort of phone banking idea, um, all of those sort of communications networks and stuff. And then they in turn delegate that to to smaller, local, more local bodies who in turn delegate it to others. People can just set up new parts of the system. And when it works, it works incredibly well. This was also incidentally the model that Extinction Rebellion has used mm. to, to great mm. effect, very effectively mm. indeed, in becoming this very powerful force very quickly indeed from a standing start. Um, and, and in theory, at any rate, a sort of voluntary network like that can beat machine politics. It can beat billionaire politics, but they haven't quite got it right yet, or we haven't quite got it right yet. You know, it needs refining. Um, uh, in Sanders, the Sanders campaign very nearly got there. That I, part of the problem, and I think also with the Corbyn campaign, was that you had this sort of uh, this real split between the traditionalists, the sort of you know traditional centrally organised socialist approach, where this is the way we do it, this is the way we've always done it, yeah. not quite getting what the new people were doing, which is uh, you know you get young often very techie people saying, look, there's this great new app I've developed which can allow us to do this. I say, what's an app? You know? <laughs> yeah. it's, it, and, and so there's a real sort of cultural chasm uh, on, within both of those campaigns. And, you know, it was bridged to an extent, but it, it wasn't like, it, it wasn't as streamlined as it could have been. With Extinction Rebellion, we didn't see the cultural chasm. We, it was much more streamlined and, and you know, much, they really, really got big organising. They really understood how it can work and, and pioneered new aspects of it. So it's very much a model in, pro, in process, um, which, you know, is, it'll never be completed because society will never be completed. You just sort of keep experimenting, you keep pushing it forward. But... I think it's got enormous potential and we're only just beginning to explore it. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I hopefully that will, you know, this, if there is going to be a positive that to come out of this pandemic will be a catalyst towards those ideas and actually how we can instigate social change, all these different initiatives. Um, and I, I also wanted to touch on this concept of uh, the donut economy, which I, I believe you borrowed from another book that you mentioned in, in the book you wrote. I never, I've never come across that before, but it really did appeal to me because I think, you know, I, I've been sold this idea and I think we've all been sold this idea that for a society to function, we need to have a constant level of growth. And that doesn't really uh, entertain the health of the environment, which therefore has a, a knock-on effect on the health of our society as well. Um, uh, so I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about what a donut economy is and how you think we could do this in a, in a uh, post-crisis or post-pandemic world. So so this is um, the work um, of Kate Rayworth, a, a fantastic economist, who um, has really sort of pioneered this idea of um, how to make sure that everyone's needs are met without bursting through planetary boundaries. And, you know, there has, I mean, in, in, in fairness, there's been quite a lot of work on this before, but she's pulled it together in a really beautiful way um, and in a visual way. The reason it's called donut economics is that she, she has a diagram, which is like a, an American donut with a hole in the middle. And the hole is the social floor through which we shouldn't fall. Um, we, uh, set by the sustainable development goals, you know, everyone should have um, good shelter, good food, good education, good health care, good sanitation, 
a good um, uh, uh, enough political power, uh, good gender relations, you know, all of those basics of a good life that no one should fall below that hole. And the outer ring of the donut is the planetary boundaries. How, how much um, greenhouse gases can we produce before we broach those boundaries? How, how, how much nitrogen can, can we use? How, how much uh, biodiversity loss can the world stand? These things which are being set by scientists as the sort of outer limits we shouldn't breach. And unfortunately, yeah, we're breaching them left, right and centre. And she's saying, right, let's imagine an economics which lives within the, between those two boundaries. Mm. Um, so between the inner ring and the outer ring, that's the the safe space in which we should be living, where we can have you know human well being within a thriving web of life. And then she tries to build an economics around that notion of of that safe space. And 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 I just think the way she's pulled it together and presented it is is really compelling. And so do a lot of other people. There's a lot of cities now which are picking up donut economics. Amsterdam recently announced that um, after the pandemic, that's going to be its economic direction. Oh, wow. um, and, and quite a few other cities around the world are, are, are now using it and developing it. So I think there'll be, we'll see a lot more of it. And uh, that's a really positive thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see or well, hope, hopeful that we, we can have like a new era of progressive politics that really does recognize those, those social values that I think a lot of people are recognizing themselves. Um, and maybe some more accidental activists as well. I mean, I, I kind of regard myself after this conversation as an accidental activist without really realizing that I was instigating some change on perhaps a bigger level or inspiring other people. Um, but, you know, with the rise of social initiatives and, and things that you mentioned in your book as well, um, I think, you know, people will realize that actually they have a lot of um, impetus uh, and a lot of um, a power. Um, one thing uh, I want to ask you about is, is uh, how you're personally coping actually through this uh, time period and what is, uh, what is in your suite of self-care tools to help you get through this time? Thank you, Ruby. Well, look, I'm massively luckier than most. I mean, I really am, you know, one, uh, I've basically been self-isolating for 57 years. You know, <laughs> I, 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 I do my own thing. I work from home. Um, keep myself quite good company yeah. uh, i'm very lucky in that um uh, you know uh, we all really get on within my family which also makes a huge difference you know i can't imagine what it would be like to be basically stuck indoors with people you don't get on with yeah. um we've got a small garden which makes a difference most importantly for me at the moment we've got an allotment which years ago uh, with friends, we planted up with fruit trees. So we got like 40 mature fruit trees on this allotment and getting down there to manage it. Well, is it, put it this way, it's going to be the best kept allotment in history by the time this yeah. lockdown is yeah. finished. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of our allotment neighbours pointed out that actually working in an allotment is, is exercise, uh, work, and obtaining food so it ticks all three of the boxes for yeah. why you're allowed out so yeah. technically we could be there all day yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and um and it's um and and so it's a bit of a lifeline for me uh i mean i'm i'm finding the balancing difficult because um um i'm i'm teaching because the schools are closed um i've got an eight-year-old um uh we locked down together with um, one of our neighbours, uh, part of the whole community thing being developed around here. Um, so from the very beginning, we said, right, we are a, an isolation unit, us two families, um, because uh, their daughter is best friends with our daughter. And they would both go nuts, I think, without each other. But with each other, they're fine. That is really great. And we've got four parents to teach them. Um, so we can split it up a bit. One of them is a professional teacher, which helps oh, wow. enormously. Yeah. But we can all bring in something different. And so I've been teaching, I've been using the sort of a sort of version of the Finnish model, teaching um, ecology, sort of project-based learning, where you use it then, you use sort of ecological um, experiments and and learning to the, go into maths, to go into science, into geography, into literacy, into all sorts of painting, all sorts of other areas. Um, and that's been working reasonably well. I mean, I, it's challenging. What's challenging is sort of moving between being a parent and a teacher and saying, right, I'm a teacher now. 
So you've got to listen to me like you listen to a teacher, and you can't cheat me like you know, like like you would cheat me as a parent. And and that that's that's a struggle, you know. And sometimes I get it right, and sometimes I get it wrong. Obviously, I've got a huge amount to learn about how to teach, um, but you know, it's an education for all of us. Yeah. Um, so that's been that's been good, uh, mostly uh, frustrating occasionally, um, but at the same time, um, I'm. Um, researching a book and part of what I wanted to do for the book is um, learning soil ecology I mean trying to get up pretty close to degree level yeah. on soil ecology and it just happens that's the one kind of ecology you could do at home yeah, so you yeah. Get more or less a complete picture in your own garden or better still in in our allotment because there you've got a nicely structured soil and I've just been spending hours at a time with my head in a hole basically yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> um, and and it is fascinating i mean it's really mind-blowing i mean the soil it's like you know i thought I've, I've got to my age and never done this properly before because once you're in it it's like snorkeling you're in this other world it's completely other world you know you have to learn about what all the different soil organisms soil animals and things are learn what you're seeing and as soon as you do it's like this is just unbelievable. This yeah. is fantastic. I mean, it's really, really mind blowing. So, uh, I've been, uh, you know, that's been a good project to do. I've been enjoying that. I, I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by that. I, I'm, I'm getting a, a couple of guests on to talk about regenerative farming, the importance of the, uh, the, the biome of the soil, um, and I know a couple of colleagues that I perhaps should introduce you to as well that have been studying um, the ecology of the soil for, for, for their entire lives. So, and I think hopefully that permeates into mainstream discussion because I think it's a, a, along with um, viral pandemics. Uh, the, the 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 literal threat of um, microbial resistance uh, that I think is going to be and not to catastrophize but I think it's going to be even worse uh, over the next five ten years and you know as someone who's witnessed over the my short relatively short medical career of uh, just over 10 years um, the progress by which we've started using uh, third or fourth line antibiotics in my short it's it's that's really scary when you when you put it like when I was a junior doctor in 2009 um, we would have to call the microbiology consultant and have another consultant confirm that they were going to use this agent and now it's become first line in some hospitals which is really blows my mind but um the importance of the soil and how that provides nutrition to the plants which therefore provides nutrition to us that really needs a lot more attention so i can't wait for that piece of work i think that's uh, very very well, well worth it and um, a lot of people will hopefully change their minds about the way they eat and and see the environment in that respect yeah, I mean, we're, we're, I'm very glad you raised the issue of antibiotic resistance because it keeps me awake at night as well. And, and it is mind-blowing. Three quarters of the world's antibiotics are used on farms. Mm. Yeah, uh, and, and most of them, not even to make animals better, but to stop them from getting ill, mm. used prophylactically, put in their feed, because when you cram so many animals together in a chicken farm or a pig farm or something, they're bound to get terrible plagues. And so... It's just this is total madness. This is squandering mm. this precious resource, mm. and and as you say, it's just you know. I mean, uh, I've had eight um, lots of procedures over the last two years because I had cancer, and then um, uh, that was just got sorted out thanks to the NHS. We're wonderful, amazing people. Um, but then I had complications arising from the operation, so I had all sorts of stuff going on. And every time I had to take antibiotics, in in total, in those two years, I've taken thirteen courses of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. I would I would have died thirteen times over, probably, or at least about mm -hmm. ten times over, if it weren't for those courses of antibiotics. And and mm -hmm. you know, as you know, you can't do surgery without antibiotics. You can't have chemotherapy without antibiotics. You can't have safe childbirth without antibiotics. And yeah, we are totally stuffed if we lose our antibiotics. And yet it's like everything else, we're just squandering it. This amazing yeah. resource. What, what, you know, what, I mean, collectively, you know, individually, we can be really intelligent. But when it comes to the systems under which we work, those systems are really stupid. Yeah. And, yeah. and so this and it's again comes down to this sort of this sort of the wrong people being in charge and setting up the wrong institutions for us to work through institutions which say yeah it's fine to just keep slapping antibiotics all over pigs <laughs> yeah yes yeah. 
and you know, it really does speak to this sort of um, this perspective that I'm seeing a lot perpetuated on social media and by some prominent leaders as well, that this is the fault of a particular country, i.e. China, because they have had wet markets. And they, they promote, you know, the, the inappropriate collection of animals. We have to look at ourselves because it could have quite easily come from any farming system across the industrialized nations. And we are going to be witnessing something in the next 10 years, uh, by, by all the predictions that I've seen, that will stem from the lack of um, looking at ourselves and actually, you know, trying to practice uh, best as we can ourselves before, like, you know, blaming others. And yeah, th th that's kind of worrying. And, and, and hopefully people realize that. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's fair to say that what's been going on in those wet markets is terrible. You know, it's mm. just the, the wildlife trade has been devastating to wildlife. And of course, it's just a time bomb, you know, for, for you bringing together species which would never otherwise have encountered each other. And there's bound to be transmission of disease. I mean, I first became aware of this um, over 30 years ago when I was working in the Amazon. And every so often there'd be a rabies out. out a, a, a rabies outbreak and large numbers of people would die of rabies because you were a long long way from any nearest health center mm. and the reason this was happening was people were cutting down the forest and the vampire bats which up until then had been feeding on the sloths and monkeys in the forest canopy would have no sloths and monkeys they'd come down to earth and start feeding on the people instead i mean it was really it was yeah. sinister this was properly yeah. sinister people were terrified because, you know, suddenly you just wake up with rabies, you know, and it was like, mm. whoa, you know, horrifying. Mm. So and and so there is, you know, uh, uh, unquestionably, it's terrible. That, you know, what they're doing in the wet markets is terrible. Mm. But as you say, you know, we are in no position to point the finger to anyone else because you just look at the average intensive pig farm or broiler chicken unit. You know, you just got a, a perfect reservoir for disease as well as the most appalling cruelty um, on those animals all crammed together with miserable and meaningless lives just being fattened up as quickly as possible for slaughter. Yeah, yeah. And on that positive note, uh, <laughs> I'm going to let you get back to teaching your uh, your children uh, <laughs> using project work. Um, it's been fascinating chatting to you, George, honestly. And uh, I really do... Um, uh, commend you for your work and your continued activism and you know it, it's been amazing to chat to you and I, I can't wait for the next book I think it's going to be brilliant thanks so much Rupi it's really lovely to talk and look really good luck with all you're doing I, I, I massively admire the, the, the way you're sort of you know doing what you know the rest of us probably wouldn't have the courage to do um, in the <laughs> NHS so thank you and keep up the great work appreciate it George thank you so much <laughs> cheers Thank you so much for watching this video. There's so many others for you to enjoy right here. Check out thedoctorskitchen.com, sign up to the newsletter where I give science-based recipes every single week. There's a podcast, there's two books, there's loads more content on social media, doctors underscore kitchen, and I hope to see you there.